I, I really hope that people also, if they read it, realize this is not a book that is meant to overcoddle the millennials or Gen Z. This is truly believing that this is the alpha infrastructure to building significantly large, successful businesses. You got your perspective. I just wanna be happy, don't you wanna be happy? It is very clear to me, 25 years into my career, that kindness and empathy and patience and humility are actually the foundations. And I think the things that all of us think about as soft skills and emotional intelligence are actually the hard skills. That it is far easier for me to find people who are good at the task or have good math skills than it is to find people who are capable of being the bigger woman or bigger man in the face of pressure or adversity. And so for 20 years or so, this has been in my subconscious. COVID, like for many of us, gave me a time to reflect and I immediately went into writing the book uh, on a couple of reasons. One, I'm incredibly aware that there's a lot of young people paying attention to my moves, are fans of what I do, and I thought it would be a disservice if I wasn't incredibly aggressive in my communication on the things that I see as a winning formula, it becomes double important when I realize that most people don't talk about kindness as the single alpha skill in building a successful empire. And I thought it was a unique take. It's also very nuanced. The reason the subtitle is ingredients is when I was going through my process, I realized, oh, I never just deploy empathy. I never just deploy patience. In every situation, it's actually three or four different traits, often traits that are in a conflict with each other. It's very interesting to be tenacious and ambitious while being patient. And so I I liked the concept of ingredients because it's like cooking a meal. I think we all believe that sweet and sour chicken is something that is delicious, but sweet and sour can see a conflict. I felt that I was the right person at the right time and what has transpired in the last 18 months, because I wrote the book very quickly in the beginning of COVID, obviously it takes time for it to come out and things of that nature. Many of us are thinking about things in the business world around the concept of the great resignation and, and the concept of people even applying into businesses in the first place in a world of options. I think the importance of being a leader that understands these traits has even compounded in the last 18 months since I even wrote it, which feels serendipitous and exciting for me. And I I really hope that people also, if they read it, realize this is not a book that is meant to overcoddle the millennials or Gen Z. This is truly believing that this is the alpha infrastructure to building significantly large, successful businesses. What I, what I love is this refreshing take on leadership, and I can speak from a woman's perspective that we've, many of us have mimicked this ideal, hard leadership, uh, because that was the archetype, that was what was you know, the right leadership. And you're taking the narrative into a different direction, and so, What would you say to those who would point to titles of industries and say, well, this is not, you know, how they were, or maybe this is not what you describe in the book? Look, I believe that you can have short-term success in many ways, and I believe that the world has been very clear to us over the last centuries that fear and negativity are sometimes a fuel for short-term success. You know, my argument is that it's not as powerful as brightness and love. That that hate is a powerful trait. Uh, But I just believe it never beats love in the end. And I believe that to be true in business. Of course there have been people who've been successful who are not kind leaders. That 
doesn't mean that it should be mimicked. And I would also ask, if you have the luxury of interacting with people in their 80s and 90s, and especially those who've had major financial success by being mean and negative, I think you'll find that many 80, 90 year olds who've built their empire with darkness have incredible levels of regret and actually lived quite unhappy lives. And so my question simply to business people is, is the money worth the unhappiness? You talk a lot about empathy and kindness and I think probably the times that we've gone through the last couple of years with everything that's happening in the world, we need more kindness and empathy than ever. And the question here is how do you deploy these attributes without enabling that behavior, without... You know, well, I think first of all, people want everybody else to be kind and empathetic. So my favorite part of this book is accountability. You know, everyone has become incredibly good at judging others. The world is addicted to pointing fingers. I have never seen the world louder about telling everybody else what they're bad at. So I think the way to deploy successful kindness and empathy is to actually start with yourself. I also wanna remind everybody that deploying kindness when the other person is kind to you is very easy. I challenge the world to start having a conversation with itself of does it have the ability to be kind and empathetic in the face of negativity. My leaders are incredibly kind to my employees when everything's going well. I don't need peacetime generals. I need leaders when things are bad and hectic to be able to be the bigger woman and bigger man in that situation to create a framework of kindness and empathy. So, you know, for me, it's about the accountability of being able to be that person. Right now, we are in a world where everyone is so quick to get triggered by bad behavior that they fight fire with fire, which is why so little is being accomplished in society, in politics, and in the workforce. And so for me, I think that we are not spending enough time with our thumbs and we need to stop being addicted to our fingers. One of the things you speak about is self-awareness, which is foundational to any evolution of us as as human beings. Tell us a bit about that. How do we, where do we start with self-awareness? This is hard. The concept of teaching someone to be more self-aware is something I've been thinking about for a long time. You know, I think the thing that drives so many of us crazy in the world is interacting with those that struggle with self-awareness. I think one of the hardest things for people to deal with is hypocrisy. We struggle with it, and I struggle with it. Um, The exercise in the book that I decided to do was creating frameworks for the people that know you the best to create a safe space for them to be able to tell you the truth. I think one of the reasons people struggle with self-awareness is because they have enablers around them that are allowing them to get away with bad behavior. And so I'm spending a lot of time trying to think about how one puts the people that knows them the best in a safe place to actually give them the critical feedback that could be the jarrer of a journey towards self-awareness. It's a very tough challenge. I don't know if I have the answer. What I can tell you is, no question, the business leaders that I admire, the human beings that I admire, are the ones who are off the charts in self-awareness. I'm incredibly grateful for the luck of the DNA game that I think gave me a lot of it, I would argue that the only reason I have any level of popularity is because of self-awareness, because of the kind of communicator I am and my personality, I would be completely not palpable if I didn't have high levels of self-awareness because I have some really funny attributes as a communicator. And so it's a conversation we need more of. I do think that self-awareness has a very interesting relationship with accountability. I think that a lot of people actually know what their shortcomings are, but 
they try to navigate the world in a way where they are hoping that people don't notice. And it's something I'm thinking a lot about. One of the things I actually loved in the book is the part where you talk about relationship with time. Yes. And you hear often people say, it's too late for me to start a new business, to move my career, to be married, whatever that may be. So I'd love for you to give us that perspective. The rules of the world right now on when you should have your life figured out, when you should be married, have children, make money, buy a home, and everything else are based completely on when people live to 45 and 55 years old, period. The rules of our society have not changed in a very long time of expectation on what we should be doing with our lives. The problem with that is we're living to 100. The concept that a 25 year old should have everything figured out is laughable. Most 60 year olds I know don't have their life figured out. Why are 25 year olds putting such pressure? I think that we have societally done a very poor job to our youth, which gets me to a place that's even more emotional for me, which is we must challenge the notion that so many parents in the world use their kids' success as their own self-esteem. What that does is it pressures children into short-term behaviors around education, occupation, and relationships that are often missteps based on very small windows of time. One of the great reasons I struggle with the way that education is sold in our society is we train kids from a very young age that you will be judged every 90 days on your actions. I think it leads to very, very vulnerable behavior that maps to our adulthood. So yes, I think that way too many people are judging themselves in the short term. Yes, I believe that if you are 63 years old, you still have 30 years to achieve fulfillment and happiness. And I think it's time that we have a totally different conversation around age to the point where in actuality, the fact that we pressure children into starting to get serious at 22 is actually ludicrous. 22 to 30 should be wild, wild, high risk, high reward behavior because it's practical. Because even if you blow it and nothing goes well, you can start getting serious at 30, 35. And so we ask people to, now you're a grown up, get a real job and all this other ludicrous behavior that I think has really hurt society. I think, I think a lot of it is predicated on outside affirmation. I think many people start doing things for validation from strangers um, or their parents or others. And I think we have to have more thoughtful conversations about it. I, I, think, it's, I, I think it's quite depressing, for lack of a better word, that there are people that are 40 years old, still have 60 years ahead of them, and they think it's over. I think that needs to stop. So one of the things that surprised me in the book is your health. Mm. That's because Gary Vee, the guy that sits up here, is the king of candor. Exactly. I shoot it straight as an arrow when I'm talking to the world. But when Gary Vaynerchuk, the executive, is sitting across from an employee that he loves and he's scared to tell her or him that they're bad at their job because he fears that that's gonna put them into a spiral of being scared that they're about to be fired is a lesson that has taken me over 20 years to learn. When I, when I started really reflecting on why in a world where I really don't care about the money, why would I have any employee that has ever worked with me be unhappy with me? And I had to look in the mirror and realize that the greatest shortcoming of my life, let alone my professional career, has my, been my inability to be candorous about my opinions and feelings, which has led to subconscious and then conscious resentment towards that individual, which has led to conflict, which has led to me randomly firing somebody out of left field for them, even though I thought they should have known all along. That was a very difficult thing for me to 
come to grips with because my greatest pride as a leader is the elimination of fear. When I realized that my lack of candor was actually creating macro fear because nobody actually knew where they stood with me, it was one of the darkest days of my career, but it was also one of the greatest days of my career because it started the process of me starting to figure it out and me being vulnerable and putting it in my book for everyone to see, especially when my reputation as a content creator is that is my strength, was an important step in my own evolution. What helped you actually evolve in that, in that space? Reading, reading Facebook groups of former employees that worked for me saying I was a jerk. It's incredibly challenging for me. I, I genuinely don't like money enough to have people not like me. I don't know what else to tell you. It's a complete brain twist for me that this could be. And I finally had to take on accountability because it was very easy for me to blame poor performers because everybody around them also thought they sucked. So it was easy for me to justify like they were tone deaf, they weren't self-aware. But the reality is I never gave them a chance to fix it because I wasn't willing to give them constructive criticism. And I really, so much of my strengths and so much of this book is really just a story of a boy who idolizes his mom, but his mom also isn't great at candor and he picked up on that as well, who also had a father who was exceptional at candor, but his delivery of that candor was so terrible that he demonized the candor without realizing it was the vehicle that the candor was being delivered in that was the problem, not the candor. And so that was a process of self-reflection and experience and for all the kids in here, no matter how great you think you are, and I thought I was super great at 22, let me give you a preview. The gray hairs come with some value. So on another another attribute, optimism. Mm. So, it's easy to be optimistic when things are good, when you face a hurdle or two, but if your life is not you every day, if things are really hard, where do you draw optimism from? Well, this is where the ingredients come into play. Uh, my optimism comes from gratitude. When you are grateful for what you have versus envious for what you don't have, Optimism comes second nature. Life is always going to be challenging, but perspective is something we all need a lot more of. We sit here today in this gorgeous room while 850 million, almost 10% of the world does not have access to clean water. 850 million people in this world do not have access to clean water. I have not been able to put the pieces together to be upset about a business deal going awry in a world where 850 million other people don't have access to clean water. I am dumbfounded by people's inability to be grateful for what they have. For me, optimism is second nature because I'm completely based in fundamental gratitude and I wish more people were too. And that's why I like talking about gratitude. Um, those attributes that we're speaking about, the big hair, beautifully selected, and the way that you put those ingredients together actually are so practical in terms of how one can use this, this book to, to evolve and to kind of reflect. Um, can, can I jump in on that? Yes. It's incredibly important especially for those in here who don't have a lot of context on me, I've been listening to the first 10, 15 minutes of this. Let there be no confusion. I am a full-pledged operator. I am only grounded in practicality. For 22 of the last years, I have been responsible to make payroll 100% on my own back. Everything I'm talking about right now is the framework for those successes. Yet, I could be very empathetic that somebody listening right now may think that this is a very optimistic, delusional ideology. That is why I wrote the book. This is the furthest thing from delusion. 
but society for over a hundred years of business have told all of you that the things I'm talking about almost have no place in business or is a very nice to have as long as you have all the other skills. I promise you, all those other skills are a commodity. The reason most businesses fail is because they're incapable of firing the people that are producing dollars but are destroying morale. Maybe one more question if you have take questions from the audience. Uh, Gary, with these attributes, is, is this something that actually we can work on or are we like that? You know, we're born with empathy or not? This is a great question. I believe that we are born with a lot of our traits. I believe we are then parented and some of the traits go up and down. I believe we are environments of our neighborhood, our country, our culture. When I tell you the thing that comes least natural to me in the world is candor one-on-one and for me to see where I am today as a 46-year-old man, everybody in this room has the ability to grow in many of these attributes. Most don't want to put in the work. Most would prefer not to do the things that come hard to them. Most would hope that it goes unnoticed. Nothing goes unnoticed. People may not tell you, but nothing goes unnoticed. I believe in the human spirit. The world is very black and white to me on this one. People evolve. People change. People can get stronger at certain things. People can get weaker at certain things. And so I am incredibly optimistic on humans' capacity to evolve. What it requires is first acknowledging its truth, seeing it. One of the reasons I produce the content that I produce is with the hopes that just one, when I do this right now, Literally when I tell you that I'm just hopeful that one person in this room is listening and something triggers, one, because that's profound. Saying a couple of sentences that shift a person's perspective which allows them to start building towards a better place for themselves and the people they love is a great gift and I take on that responsibility and I think everybody in this room who is fortunate enough to be in a happy place has a requirement to start communicating it because we live in a world today where negativity is incredibly loud and positivity tends to be silent. And I think if you are positive, you have an obligation to your fellow man to communicate it and make it louder. Perhaps we take a few questions from the audience. Yeah, these microphones that are lined up here excite me to no end. I hope that tons of people, I hope tons of people, is that how we're doing it? People are gonna come up to the mics? Please, I mean, I see a lot of hands. Line up and there's a lot of mics. Let's line up and do it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I used to be a scientist a couple of years ago, and I so vividly remember that one day I was punished by my company to be compassionate, mm. um, where they came up to me and they're like, you're supposed to do, do your job when I was looking up to someone who mm. had a hard life. That was the day I decided that I don't want to do this. And I was, I was looking at your content all these days, and that was my trigger point, and I decided to pursue photography on the weekends, and now it's been four years, I've done that full-time, freelance, I freaking love it. <laughs> And like, I always say, thankfully, the art saved me, and that was my savior, and now I'm into NFTs, and I'm, I'm trying to bring more people into this space, I'm going to accompany the NFT space. What I'm trying to do is, I want to get most of my friends into this space. I feel like the web three economy, this creative economy, is, is changing the world. Yes. What I struggle with, and I want to know about this, because you talk so, about empathy and compassion, and I regard myself as a very compassionate person, so much so that sometimes I want to help my friends to get into this space, and I'm unable to do that because of their liabilities and their responsibilities. 
How did you, because I know you did say a bunch of general people yep. that you have no obligation to kind of explain to them, but with your, with your friends and families, how did you come to terms that you can't do so much for everyone? Because I deploy patience. Everyone's on a different time schedule. Uh, one of the great things that works for me is a lack of expectations. You know, I want everybody that I ever talk to to see what I see. I'm also incredibly aware that that is not going to be the case on my timeline. You've gotta realize that even though you're coming from a beautiful place, the energy that you're talking about right now is selfish. You wanna feel the endorphin hit of bringing value to somebody you love, which is a wild concept to realize that it's selfish. All you can do is stay consistent with your communication. I mean, there are certain things that I taught my father that took me 26 years to accomplish. If you love them, you won't stop communicating. Thank you so much. Gary, uh, my name is Philippe. Uh, great to see you on stage, but also awesome to see your team, your offline. Thank you. You really help us keep up. Thank um, you. My question is uh, how do you combine basically the balance between being an operator and contributing so much content and the time to everything else? Thank you for saying that. A uh, couple ways. One, I am very passionate about giving back. Giving back comes in the form of financial give back, but ironically, I believe the biggest way that I give back is by being intellectually generous. By putting out all my content to the world for free, I'm bringing people value. And so I compromise some of my operational upside on my selfish side because I allocate more time to put out content to the world, comma, I'm incredibly operationally strong and I figured out many years ago that if I just filmed every moment of my life, even though in the beginning it was gonna be very weird, that it was a more efficient model for me to create content that I could share to the world. I am one of the most prolific content creators in the world and I never sit down and do content. I just actually live my life and it's just filmed. And so I think it comes from the ambition to give back and from being actually a good operator. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, extra, books, kind of extra free books. <laughs> Cheers. Hi, Gary. How are you? Uh, I'm here to thank you. My name is Matt. And I have a silly question for you, uh, which triggers me a lot. Like, is it better to sit to get in the car and start driving, or knowing where to go? Hmm, that's a really fun question. Uh, I believe the answer is very individual. I believe if you're the kind of person that has spent too much time thinking about where to go, that it's time to get in the car and start driving. I believe that if you're a person that continues to drive and you have no idea where you're going, that it's time to pull over and give some thought to think about where you're going.